section and I get to maybe do more of the stuff where there's a lot of gaps or where it's just a lot more gray and a lot more vague, but it still can be quite fun. So in terms of nutrition and practice, we do the research as Nesson has looked at. We then generally try to formulate it into some sort of concise picture of a guideline, and then we try to then individualize this and prescribe it to an athlete. But I'm sure that most of you know for your own athletic careers or any sort of exercise-based nutrition idea, how many of you actually then do what the nutritionist has asked you to do? And in adolescence, this is even more fun because they're just adolescents and they don't necessarily want to listen to what you've said or they don't necessarily see the positive side of putting something into practice. So in general, the biggest challenge is taking all this knowledge we have and then translating into the actual behaviors. And so one of the things that I've obviously tried to look at in my own practice um, is moving past this idea of knowledge-based sort of education sessions around nutrition and moving on to this idea of literacy. So just a bit of background in health literacy. Um, health literacy has developed mostly in public health, but it is the ability to translate that knowledge into actual decisions and behaviors. So it's figuring out from the perspective of the adolescent rugby player, what are the missing pieces of the puzzle in terms of getting them to take the knowledge that they may already have and translate it into the behaviors that they need to apply to actually then improve their performance. Knowledge is then only one segment of a nutrition literacy model. So this is the model from a Canadian group who've been looking at it more in adolescents and adults, but more in a public health setting. But that's fine, because obviously all we do is we just try to transfer it across into a sports specific setting. But as you can see in terms of the different components, you've got knowledge as one part, food skills, um, which I'm sure as you guys will understand is mostly around cooking and shopping and all that type of stuff, food decision making. Um, and as you might have seen, we probably make over 200 food decisions every single day. And you need to get the efficacy and the confidence around those decisions to also improve, as well as the idea of the ecological factors. So that usually looks at things like ethics around uh, which types of foods you eat, uh, organic versus non-organic, GMO, um, animal sort of treatment, all that type of stuff, vegetarianism, of which most adolescents, and especially in rugby, are probably not particularly focused on, but it does develop over time. So what I've done, and, and as I said, this is where we now get a bit more vague because there is no sports specific model. There is also no specific model in terms of, if we look at the physical development model and a lot of what you guys have heard already, is that there are very specific time frames and very specific, specific progression around the idea of how you grow and physically develop as an, an adolescent athlete and then specifically in rugby. But there is no nutrition progression model or any idea of what is the ultimate optimal nutrition literacy or nutrition behavior set that you should have as an adult rugby player. So I, you'll have to bear with me, but a lot of this is going on my own experience as a practitioner, but also on essentially trying to develop an idea of what do we think they should be able to do to effectively put the guidelines and the things that we prescribe them into practice. That we're not really preparing the athletes to suddenly go from being taken care of and essentially having someone cook for you to then having to cook for yourself and take care of yourself food-wise. Also, the time frame where we really expect the most out of these athletes in terms of their progression and their development. Me telling an adolescent athlete what to do sometimes doesn't always come across as the best of, um, form or, or translation of the advice. Uh, Richie McCaw telling you what to do, him or another version of that would sometimes be a lot more effective. So trying to like tap into that idea of the adolescent mind and leading with somebody else giving the message rather than me personally doing it myself. However, as I said, we can't, I can't expect uh, somebody to obviously learn complex physical movements in one go. We break skills down into smaller parts physically, so we have to do the same thing from a nutrition perspective is to focus primarily on habits first. And so habits, the one part about habits is it doesn't necessarily require a good knowledge base. Also probably because adolescent rugby players don't necessarily care very much whether it's carbs, protein, fat, micronutrients, antioxidants, blah, blah, blah. They essentially just know, will it make me bigger or faster or meaner or stronger? And so sometimes that's all I need to say. Eat this, it'll make you better, go. There doesn't need to be much discussion around what's actually in it or whether or not they need a comprehensive knowledge understanding of exactly what is in that food and what it's going to do. And I do also find that we have a tendency to teach nutrition very much in that reductionistic format where we say, here, drink the milk. It's good for your bones because it has calcium in it. But that is terribly simplistic when it comes to being able to reduce a food to one thing because we don't really know what other words to use and we haven't really created a new language of communication around 
teaching food skills. It, it, well, there is no research on this in sport and adolescent athletes yet. But this is a version of what I've have used recently in terms of maybe outlining how you progress the nutrition skills of an adolescent. So as you can see, 10 to 15 years, it's still quite a large chunk of time. I do think you could probably break these down into smaller age groups if you wanted to. Um, things about basic snacks, awareness of food, uh, always instituting the pre and the post session in terms of, as Nesan said, like the energy expenditure of training and recovery. And then vague sort of ideas around the fact that if you've got more training, you need to eat more. If you have less training, you eat less. Some of that obviously has to, again, be interpreted in the context of the individual 100%. Uh, as they get into that next sort of five-year segment, 15 to 20 years of age, obviously the idea that they can cook maybe between five and 10 basic meals. There is no science behind that number. I probably would say that that's what it sounds like in terms of being a reasonable 18 year old. Interesting part about using this type of approach is that it should fit right on top of your rugby progression, rugby skills progression, physical development, et cetera. They have to be integrated. 